So this is predict the products. We're supposed to predict, uh, predict the product from these reagents. Okay, and even though it's predict the products, we should still be drawing the mechanisms as uh, a thinking aid. Like, so this is what's like confusing me too. Okay, so uh, why don't we get started here? Um, you guys have any ideas how to begin here? Let's take a look. Um, so, any thoughts? I think that the CL is the leading group. Or that, that's what's going to lead. Good. And then the second, and that's going to be attached by, or that's going to attach to the Na plus. Who is? The CL is. Very good. Attached. Okay. And it's a secondary plus. carbon. That's important. That's important. Yeah. And so if it's secondary, it's still neutral. It can still be. SN1 or SN2. So then you have to move on to the the nucleophile is a good nucleophile. It's an S with a negative charge. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's going to go more towards SN1, isn't it? Oh, wait. Or yes, because SN1 is what's affected by the nucleophile that's in. No, wait. Let's talk that through together now. Okay. okay. So um, you, uh, let's label the alpha carbon. Let's get into the habit of always labeling the alpha carbon. And as you guys saw, um, this was a secondary alpha carbon. Right. Yes. So it's a secondary alpha carbon. Um, so what we want to do, let's try um, using that table on page three of the handout and see if that helps us. So which row should we be in for the table on page three, at the bottom of page, page three? Which row are we in? The secondary. Secondary. All right, and now can you find which column are we going to be in? Good nucleophile. Right, how do you know? You see that actually sulfur with a negative charge is actually listed here. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's one of the middle columns. Um, if you look at the middle column here, sulfur with a negative charge is listed in this column. So that's the column that's labeled good nucleophile and weak base. So a sulfur with a negative charge is a good nucleophile and a weak base. So um, which cell is that going to take us to here? Um, actually, that's the most complicated cell. I think if you look, that's the cell that could be either SN2 or SN1, right? You can see why, because it's in kind of in the middle of the table. Since it's in the middle, it's kind of, all, all the different factors are in moderation. It, it, there's nothing that's very uh, extreme here. So, um... This is a polar aproteic solvent, right? So it, it's... Would you SN2. agree? See, that's, okay, so polar aproteic, but doesn't it have, can't it supply protons? Yeah, so let's go through that. Um, so we have to review, so who's the solvent here? This double yeah, it's double good that you recognize that this was the solvent. A lot of people wouldn't even know what the heck this is, but yeah. this is the solvent. Yeah. Oftentimes the solvent is written next to the arrow, so this is supposed to be the solvent. So we need to know what's the difference between a polar protic solvent and a polar aprotic solvent. Well, we could go into a lot of detail here, uh, but to save time, um, we'll just say that uh, a polar protic solvent is one that can form hydrogen bonds, and a polar aprotic solvent is one that cannot form hydrogen bonds. And then you have to think back to general chemistry, because in general chemistry, you learned what types of compounds can form uh, hydrogen bonds. Um, so if you remember, it's compounds that have OH or NH bonds that can form hydrogen bonds. Okay, um, so for our purposes, a polar protic solvent is one that has at least one hydrogen bonded to an oxygen or a nitrogen, and a polar aprotic is something that has no hydrogens on an oxygen or a nitrogen. Okay, um, so is this polar protic or polar aprotic? Polar aprotic. Polar aprotic. Notice that you can kind of leave out the word polar because both solvents are polar. We're only going to consider polar solvents. We're only going to consider polar solvents. So the issue is whether is just whether it's protic or aprotic. You can see that this word protic is a little bit um, misleading because obviously protic, proton, proton is like a hydrogen. But a proton doesn't mean there's no hydrogens. That's, it just means no, yeah. It doesn't mean no hydrogens. It means no hydrogen bonds, which means no hydrogens on an oxygen or a nitrogen. This is a good trap 
because does this have hydrogens? Yeah, yes, it does have an oxygen. Okay. It has hydrogens and oxygens, but it has no oxygen-hydrogen bonds. Oh. So that's important to have in your notes. It's not good enough to have an oxygen and a hydrogen in the molecule. They must be bonded to each other. So make sure you have this in your notes. Um, in order to have a hydrogen bond, um, you need to have a covalent bond in your molecule between an oxygen and a hydrogen. Um, so uh, it's easy to get confused about that. All right, so you have to make sure, uh, or, an ox or a nitrogen and a hydrogen. So this has an oxygen, it has hydrogens, but it has no hydrogens bonded to the oxygen, which is why it's called polar aprotic. So the name can be a little misleading here. All right, so this is polar aprotic. By the way, this is acetone, uh, which is a common solvent. You should probably make a flashcard and be able, well, actually, I guess you don't need a flashcard for this. Well, maybe just so that you know this is the solvent. This is a common solvent, and it's polar aprotic. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, so this is polar aprotic. So then what's our mechanism going to be? Yeah, you can see we're in that middle cell in the table on page three. It could kind of go either way, SN1 or SN2. So he gave you some help and he put in the solvent here. Um, so we're going to predict this is going to be an SN2 reaction. Okay. Um, so that was our step here. So now let's draw the mechanism and the product from that reaction. That's right. Remember, how many steps are there in an SN2? Just one. Okay. Just one step. So everything has to happen simultaneously. So everything has to happen simultaneously. Do you have to show the C, like, is the CH3S minus an Na plus technically like a ionic bond because of their charges? It's yeah. drawn as an ionic bond. Now, probably in solution, they would be, most of these would be mainly dissociated, right. but there might be some ionic bonded. So yeah, let's talk through how to do that. So, who's going to, um, clearly this is the nucleophilic atom. So, we'll draw it attacking. And the leaving group should leave simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Remember, we put the tail here on the negative charge, not directly on the atom. That's the convention. And you don't have to show that it's going from the opposite side in this case? No. I think we met, uh, remember we saw, I mentioned briefly before that the electron pushing arrows are not supposed oh, to show okay. the geometry. So, we don't need to show the geometry with our electron pushing arrows. Now let me help you with the products there. So first of all, I'm going to um, do what I recommended earlier and replace the ethyl group with ET and the methyl group with ME. This is actually a good technique because it just simplifies your picture. Anything that simplifies your picture is going to make it easier to think clearly. Obviously, you can do whichever way you like, but uh, for me, it's clearer to use the ME and the ET here for these substituents, the methyl and the ethyl. Now, one thing you'll notice is so far, I've just redrawn the original starting material. This is actually a useful technique. Uh, this is what we could call the redraw and modify technique. Rather than try to draw the product from scratch, very often it's helpful to just redraw the starting material and then make one modification at a time. So I've just redrawn the starting material, and now I'm going to start to make one modification at a time. Well, obviously, uh, let's see, one thing I can do here is, I know that this arrow means uh, that this leaving group is leaving and taking the lone pair with it. So I'm going to break that chloride off over there and give it a new lone pair. And since the chloride is at the final head, it has to get a negative charge. Very important to make sure we get the charges right. So that was the first modification, to break off the chloride. 
All right, and who's going to replace the chloride? Well, I know that this arrow over here means that the sulfur is taking a lone pair and using it to form a bond with this carbon. So I'll put that over here. Now, this is not going to be our final answer yet, so bear with me for a second. And I'm going to show that the pair of electrons that used to be a lone pair on the sulfur is now going to be a pair of electrons in the bond between the sulfur and the alpha carbon over here. Now, this is not our final product yet. This is just our thought process. Um, and let's make sure we get the charges right. The person at the initial tail was the sulfur. The sulfur was at the initial tail. Well, the sulfur started negative, and it's losing electrons. So the sulfur should end up neutral. 